Okay, good morning. Good to have you this morning. We can start now. The Adams have come in. Amen. <laughs> Y'all happy this morning? Isn't it beautiful out? Not so hot? Just great out. How about that Roe versus Wade deal? Isn't that amazing? Well, we got a fight on our hands now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. These are just things that you know. The average person's left hand does 56% of the typing. Isn't that interesting. The cruise liner QE2 moves only six inches for each gallon of diesel that it burns. Six inches. <laughs> the microwave was invented after a researcher walked by a radar tube and a chocolate bar melted in his pocket. The words race car and kayak, kayak, how do you say that, kayak, and level are the same whether they are read left to right or right to left. There are 293 ways to make change for a dollar. I've always just heard IRS says it's mine. <laughs> Tigers have striped skin, not just striped fur. That was interesting to me. Babies are born without kneecaps. They don't appear until the child reaches two to six years old. Butterflies taste with their feet. Cats have over 100 vocal sounds. Dogs only have about 10. Isn't that interesting? If the population of China walked past you in single file, the line would never end because of the rate of reproduction. Amazing. If you are an average American, in your whole life, you will spend an average of six months waiting at red lights. <laughs> it's impossible to sneeze with your eyes open. What's that? Interesting. Our eyes are always the same size from birth but our nose and ears never stop growing. Isn't that amazing? Winston Churchill was born in a ladies' room during a dance. Women blink nearly twice as much as men. Yeah, don't you blink when you're, you're lying? Yeah. And, I'm having a little fun. <laughs> this is a wild one. Your stomach has to produce a new layer of mucus every two weeks. Otherwise, it will digest itself. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, those are good informations. One last one here. This is good for you men. A husband went to the sheriff's department to report that his wife was missing. The husband said, I've lost my wife. She went shopping yesterday and has not come home. The sergeant said, what is her height? The husband says, gee, I really never noticed, maybe about five feet tall. Sergeant, what's her build? Not slim, not really fat. 
Sergeant, what's the color of her eyes? The husband said, I never noticed. The sergeant said, what's the color of her hair? The husband says, well, it changes a couple times a year, maybe red. The sergeant says, what, what was she wearing? The husband said, could have been a skirt or shorts. I don't remember exactly. Sergeant said, did you go, did she go in a car? The husband, no, she went in my truck. The sergeant, what kind of truck you, was it? He said, a brand new Ford, F-150 King Ranch, 4x4 with Echo Boost, V8 engine, special order with a manual transmission. It has custom matching white cover for the bed, custom leather seats, DVD with navigation, 21 channel CB radio, six cup holders, four power outlets, custom uh, that says Bubba floor mats, trailer, trailer packaging, but on my special ally wheels and off-road Michelins, the wife put a small scratch on the driver's door. At this point, the husband stated, uh, started tearing up and almost cried. The sergeant says, don't worry, Bubba, we'll have your truck back. <laughs> okay, Galatians chapter 6, verse 11. Paul says, you see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. Paul is not referring to the L-E-N length of the Galatians epistle, but the P-H-Y physical size of the letters on the pages. Paul did have poor eyesight. I, when it's large letters, I get tickled because... Uh, I hadn't been to school in 13 years, and I got my GED right before I went to Tennessee Temple, and I was 29. And uh, so I went down there, and back then, I wrote in great big letters. I mean, they were big letters. And it didn't take me long to fill up an essay or something. I just, I, I, I wrote, and then my friend Charlie Chapman, he actually gave me a real fine point ballpoint pen and he's begin to teach me a little bit how to make my letters smaller and uh, so I so Paul says I've written with large letters it hurt Paul to write them but he loved them Paul also was letting them know the I am importance urgency of its message that he personally sat down and penned it himself this demonstrated the SER seriousness of the subject of Galatianism that was false. Okay, what, what would we call Galatianism? What would we call it? What would we call Galatianism? I'm not a very good teacher. Legalism. Uh, it's grace plus adding legalism. Okay, it's a mixture. Throughout Galatians, Paul has shown the difference, the D-I-F-F, difference between Galatianism and grace, works or faith, bondage or liberty, flesh or spirit, self-righteousness or God's righteousness. And he's been showing the difference throughout the book. Also remember that Paul usually did not write his epistles but used a secretary or co-worker and dictated, D-I-C, dictated his letters. An example in Romans, I, uh, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Now it was Paul's epistle, but Paul had him write the letter. I sometimes dictate a letter to Carol and she writes it but they're in my words. Uh, she'll sit there, she's typing, and I'll say this, what say, and she'll do that on an email or something and then send it out. And that's what Paul did. Even though he dictated it, it was still Paul's words. They were still God's words that God was revealing to Paul. 
But Galatians, Paul says, I was so concerned about you that I, P-E-R, personally penned this letter. Note also, 1 Corinthians, the salutation of me, Paul, with mine own hand. Colossians, the salutation by the hand of me, Paul, remember my bonds, grace be unto you, amen, written from Rome to Colossians by Tychicus, Tychicus and Onesimus. Paul usually dictated the letter, but then he personally signed, S-I-G-N, signed his epistles. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle I write. I think it's important that uh, all Paul's epistles has Paul's signature on it. And uh, that's one of the great reasons I don't believe he wrote Hebrews. <laughs> I believe he wrote his epistles and he signs his name. You say, who wrote Hebrews then? Well, that's a good question. I have no idea. Schofield did, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people think he did. <laughs> I think Luke is the natural one who introduced the book of Acts from Luke to the book of Acts to the Jewish people. And at the end, Hebrews, for them getting ready to go into the tribulation and uh, with the new covenant then in the millennium. So that's my own, uh, my own thinking, but I could be wrong on that. Notice, see, Paul personally signed each book for its authenticity and to stop. S-T-O-P, to stop false letters that some tried to use saying it was from Paul. They were counterfeits. Notice where it states there, uh, where I have it underlined, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us. So some people, they would send a letter and say, this is from Paul, when in reality, it wasn't from Paul at all. It was a false letter that they received to try to promote what they were teaching. Paul's signature signified it was from Paul and not a forgery. There is evidence of Paul's poor eyesight, just where it's underlined. Through infirmity of the flesh, I preached the gospel. In my flesh, you despise not nor rejected. If it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. And that gives you an indication that he had some eye problems. Notice, where did this physical infirmity come from? Some say in Acts 9. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus, and he was three days without sight. And so they believe he became blind on the road to Damascus, which is true. He had to have somebody lead him by the hand. However, in Acts 9, where it's underlined, Ananias comes, calls him Brother Saul, and says, That thou mightest receive thy sight. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forwith. So at that time, I believe Paul was healed, not partially, he was healed. From his eyes, from his uh, blindness. Then in Acts 14, having stoned Paul, where it's underlined, supposing he had been dead. You remember he was stoned and we believe he actually went to heaven, <laughs> third, to the paradise place at that time. But Paul rose up and walked 20 miles. That was miraculous. Some say his eye injury happened here, but again, healed not partially. Notice Second Corinthians. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, 
Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. These things were sent by Satan to try and stop Paul. How did Satan buffet Job? He took away his things and attacked him physically, didn't he? But also, this physical thorn was an affliction that was a message, M-E-S-S, -S, a message sent to Paul from Satan. It says the messenger of Satan, Satan's errand boy. And notice just Joshua, where it says the thorn in the flesh. Notice Joshua. Know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of the nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you, and scourge, scourges in your sides, and what? Thorns in your eyes. And then until you perish from off this good land, which the Lord your God hath given you, is referring to their enemies. And then Numbers, it says, remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes. And so the messenger of Satan could possibly have been that he attacked Paul physically concerning his eyes. But whatever it was, <laughs> he had poor eyesight, didn't he? Now Paul describes the legalist Galatianism again. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. The Judaizers', Judaizers main goal was to gain more converts, get them back under the kingdom program and the law. This was so they could boast, brag about their own achievements, to look impressive before others. That's called religion. <laughs> they want to impress you. They constrain you to be circumcised. These Jews were putting tremendous pressure on the Galatians' grace believers. They used tremendous guilt if one did not obey their teaching. Only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. To avoid being persecuted by Jewish leaders, they held that circumcision was NEC necessary to be justified. By the way, that's what they all thought until they had the council in Acts chapter 15, didn't they? Was it important, by the way, for a Jew to be circumcised? They couldn't be completed if they weren't. When were they circumcised? Eighth day. Male always was. And then if you converted to Judaism or you became a proselyte, you had to be circumcised. Okay. If the leading Jewish elders thought these Jews followed grace and faith alone, they would have been accused and OS ostracized from the Jewish community, excommunicated from the synagogues, exploited financially, and physically harmed. Great fear was a motive. To be thrown out of the synagogue was horrible. just like some people are thrown out of the Catholic Church. They're excommunicated. Now, in a Catholic belief, if you don't take Mass and you die, you go to hell. My sister was that way. She had divorced back in those days. That was, no, you didn't do that. And while she was divorced, if she had died in her thinking... She would have gone to hell. So she applied and asked the church to forgive her and sent them money. And she got a special thing from the Pope that she was reinstated in the Catholic Church. Thus, she could take the Mass. Thus, that would help her continue her salvation. Isn't that amazing? Later on, Carol and I, we led her to the Lord. 
If she'd only waited, she could have saved a lot of money. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> We're glad she's with the Lord right now. Let me see here. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law. Now that's important. For the believer, keeping the law was neither necessary nor possible. These Judaizers, Judaizers REV, reverence, reverence for the law was only a mask. They charged the Galatian Gentile believers that if they were not circumcised, they were not saved. Yet they themselves were not circumcised, or were not keeping the law, and had no intention to do so. Notice where I have it underlined. Christ speaking. But do you not, but do not ye after, the, after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. <laughs> They're good at telling you what to do, but they don't do. Huh? By the way, that's a good legalist. They're good at telling you what you should be doing. Hmm? But desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. These Judaizers really did not care about the Galatian believers' salvation or their life, but only making Jewish PRO proselytes out of Gentiles in order to boast of their achievement and be praised by others. Look, I got a Gentile to be circumcised. Now he's under the law and so on. And they would boast in that. Christ had said this, but woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye, uh, ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him a twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. <laughs> then the issue was circumcision. Today, the ordinance of choice is baptism, water baptism. If you separate from ordinances, Christendom will persecute you. I was always taught church has two ordinances, the Lord's Supper and water baptism. And I taught that for years until God removed some of the scales. <laughs> now we'd still do the Lord's Supper, but it's not an ordinance. It's a memorial to remember the finished work of Christ. Today, baptism, we don't water baptize. Why? Today, Ephesians 4, 6 says there's only one baptism. And we know if there's only one baptism today, it has to be spirit baptism that places you into the body of Christ. Okay? Can I get a word? Amen. Amen. Why? Without ordinances, it is against tradition, against human merit, and it is the truth of which Satan is against. Few today are willing to suffer persecution that comes from preaching a pure, P-U-R-E, gospel message. The death, burial, resurrection alone is making the believer complete in Christ and taking away human help. These Jews were actually under a curse for not keeping all the law. Galatians, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in how much? All things which are written in the book of the law to do them. 
And that's impossible to do. You can't keep the law. It's an impossibility. Verse 12 and 13 are a good summary on religion. Religion just wants to, I am, impress people with its big religious theater of pomp. <laughs> a lot of pumping going on. <laughs> I remember when, years ago we took a, a tour, a bus tour to Washington, D.C., and we had a great time. People with fellowship was wonderful. And uh, we're in Washington, D.C., and we went to church there. And it's where a lot of the dignitaries, uh, Washington elites and congressmen and senate, some of those sometimes attend, maybe the president every now and then. And uh, we go in, and we're sitting there, and all of a sudden we hear all these horns going off. Man, they got loud and all these people walking in with robes and flags of all the nations and, and just all across the front. And, I mean, a lot of theatric stuff. And then it came for the time to speak. And they were deader than a doornail. If they knew anything about God, it was, it was hidden. <laughs> it was crazy. Religion tries to bring people into SUB subjection by appearance. That's legalism. Legalism tries to make clones of people. You can't have your own personality. God forbid if your hair went go straight up. God forbid if you might have a tattoo on your arm. God forbid if hair might touch your ear. God forbid if a woman would ever wear slacks. Am I, am I preaching right now a little bit? Religion puts its followers under the laws and rules to constrain and force obedience in order to, D-I-C, dictate and control. If you don't do it our way, this is how you do it. That control. Power. Amen? That's why within fundamental circles that I came out of, that you always had the individual leader. We had Guys we held in high positions, places of respect and reverence in a sense. And you held them high because they were, they told you how to live. Huh? And uh, they didn't share that glory very much. Uh, people that want power and control, they're not willing to allow other people to do the work in the church a whole lot unless they have their stamp of approval only on that. And, of course, that's awful. Today, people are so afraid to trust grace alone. Religion says, yes, you are saved by grace, but if you truly want God's approval, you need to obey list of rules, L-I-S-T. Religion puts its followers under its performance-based system that is in conformity to its church's traditions. Why do you do that? Well, we've always done it that way. What does the Bible say? Well, I, I, we've always done it that way. It's like the woman, you know the story of the woman. She'd cut her hand a special way, right? You remember that? And uh, the granddaughter of Sutton says, why do you always cut that and put it in the, in, in the, in the skillet like that? She said, that's the only way it fits. <laughs> we always try to cookie cut our followers. And you have to allow them to be able to think. And when it comes from them, it, it's real with them. Uh, you want a person to serve the Lord because... 
they love the Lord, and not because you have a hammer over their head ready to hit them. Amen. And let me just say, I'm a grace believer, but in grace circles, they're very legalistic. You don't cross your T's and dot your I's the way they do. They're all over you. They're ready to tell you where you're wrong immediately. It's interesting, isn't it? To go from one, you become one yourself. The whole issue in religion is control and to run one's life. If you do not perform, you are not accepted. A fair show in the flesh. Religion is designated to satisfy the lust of the flesh, to feel good. Outward appearance is so beautiful. <laughs> Rome has its superstructures. Donna Smith was just telling us her daughter, Sean, her husband, uh, went to Italy for two weeks. And there they got to see uh, the Vatican and St. Peter's Square and all those things. I mean, you talk about pomp and uh, a lot of the superstructures. Then Los Angeles, you have the Crystal Cathedral. Now it's, now it's owned by the Catholics. Uh, they couldn't keep up the payments, maintain it. And so uh, they sold, but I've been there and I, I went inside and, you know, it's just all glass, a thicker glass, and it was not really very pretty. It's very simple, and uh, I thought it was amazing. And uh, but it goes real high and everything. The sound is good, and so uh, the people really put a lot of effort in that rather than in the people within the building, and uh, of course the word of God and so on. See, Paul shows the difference of being under grace and not under religion. Second Corinthians, not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy and so on. Uh, uh, the leadership of any church should never try to have dominion over people's faith. If you want to do this, do that, and you're a little different, you're a little funny, you're not violating scripture, there's nothing wrong with that. If you want to color your hair green, that's okay. Kind of funny. <laughs> Everybody's going to look at you. <laughs> As a pastor, it is not my job to run your life but to help you in the faith. People should be taught the truth and then ALL allowed to form their own convictions, trusting God's truth to work in you as it is in me. Religion has to try to control its followers, to tell them what to do and what not to do, and usually it's focused on the not. Religion will take your finances. And when I say that, more than what's required. It's good to give toward the ministry. Not saying that's a bad thing. That's a good thing to spread the good news of the gospel. We understand that. But there are some churches that go way beyond. Religion always takes its followers back under the kingdom program in order to use commands to control and do away with grace living. That's why they come up. I've mentioned several times, if you stay in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you can certainly come up with lordship salvation because the Jews were under the law and they had to do certain things. So if you focus on that, then you come up with lordship salvation. It's very easy by using Israel commands to Israel, and you try to make that for the body of Christ, even for salvation. To the unlearned, it is scriptural, thus binding. And what I mean by that, when a person gets saved, 
they have, you know, they, they're excited about being saved, and rightfully so. They're grateful for what's happened to them in their life, and then they will believe what's being taught out of the Bible. And religion will teach them something con You know, like the one guy says, well, I just, I just believe all the Bible. I'm going to do all the Bible. Really? You're going to follow the law? You're going to offer sacrifices? Yeah. So I, it's crazy. I love all the Bible, but I don't do all the Bible. I do what's commanded in the body of Christ. Galatians 6.14, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is our testimony. Faith does away with boasting. The Judaizers' glory bragged in the number of Gentiles they had forced into being circumcised. Paul makes the contrast of himself when he had been with the Galatians. He would never boast in himself, but only in in the cross of Christ. The cross demonstrated the person, power, purpose of the cross. Salvation and life are all about him. When he says the cross, it, it's about what it meant and what was accomplished there. And Paul says, God forbid, God protests the idea of anything above the cross. Verse 14, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Paul shows what faith in the cross and accomplishments have done in his and our lives. Before we were saved, we walked according to the course, direction of this world system. We were strangers and aliens to God. And his covenants, our minds being darkened, D-A-R, darkened, and with no hope. We were controlled by the world, the flesh, and the devil. But now, thank God for that. Not only has the cross caused the world to die to us as the priority, but we have died to the world in its mastery over us, and we've been set three. Amen? We can say no to the world and yes to the things of God, can't we? Last page, and I'm going down a little fast. You can look at those verses. And be not conformed to this world. Don't allow your life to be molded, conformed uh, into its what it says is who you should be. Today the world doesn't even know what it is, let alone what you should be. Isn't that true? Huh? I said to the guys on the back, how you guys doing? I said, well, I guess I shouldn't say that today. So I said, how you ones doing? <laughs> Three, note. As a believer, the world's passing interests, uncertain treasures, and fading hope no longer are trustworthy to me. No longer does the world have I an influence in my life because now the cross and all it means is between us. Where the world had its control, my full, complete interest in, now there's something between me and that, and it's the cross of Christ, and it says, follow me. Now we are wanderers, pilgrims, strangers. God has taken the veil, V-E-I-L, veil off, and we now see the world as it truly is. And if you can't see the world as being corrupt today, you can't see is not the world crazy right now? I mean, it's downright crazy. I never, ever thunk it that it would ever go to this point. It's just downright crazy. 
The last verse here that we'll look at, I'm going to look at one more thing next week. We end Galatians next week. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision. It doesn't matter if you are circumcised or not. But a new creature, that's what matters. Paul states that the issue is no longer circumcision or uncircumcision, being in the day of grace. The issue now is whether or not one is in Christ, making them a new creature and part of God's new creation. In the body of Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Amen? I'll just stop there. So we've been through a long road of Galatianism, legalism, versus grace, versus liberty, versus freedom. So I hope that it's been a blessing to you. I don't know what I'm going to teach next. I'm going to look at one the last couple verses next week, and uh, you can study that. It, it talks about the Israel of God. What does that mean, the Israel of God? And it's, it's a good little Bible study, and we'll look at that next week. And I don't know what I'm going to do after that. Uh, something, huh? I'm not sure what. I don't know whether to go another book or something topical and maybe answer a few questions, whatever it may be. I'm not sure. What, do you, what would you like? Let me see your hand. What would you like? Is it Gesundheit? <laughs> Another book? I've been through Romans. What? Topical. Okay. Okay. If you have any questions you want answered that you're having trouble with, write them on a piece of paper and next Sunday give them to me. Just say, I would like to know about this. Just do that. Let me see how many topics would come up, and then down the road I will pick a book, I promise. I, it helps me to have a book uh, so I can, uh, it tells me what I have to study, and that's helpful to me. Okay, y'all happy?